similar to what we did this year or is or is it something totally different before that you're taking to the board of ed for approval is it similar to what we had to do for accreditation great question sheila yes yeah, so the 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 work itself will be similar so we're going to um what we're proposing is just finishing up the isap components that were remaining um mm -hmm. within the you know the isap section um how it'll be um, graded on rubrics that's what we're working on right now so i think there's like four or five more sections and then that student performance so the work itself will be similar with different areas of course not rep you know no repeat work um but how you submit it will be much better. It will be within a system where you can type as much as you want without it getting cut off, or you don't have a, a limit on the, you know, what how many documents can you can submit. So the program itself will be an actual program and not just what you know what it was this past year where it caused a lot of frustration. Um, so that part will be different, but the work itself will look and feel similar, just different areas that will be requesting. And I guess, Sheila, what I can do um, as the next person starts, I'll put in um, the, the link to that criterion reference guide that was used this past year. And if you go to page 20, I have it memorized, um, that's where the new areas start. And so it kind of can give you a heads up what will be looked at this next year. But I'll, I'll put that in once the next person goes for you. Okay, so we'll look at basically any holes that we had from last time or didn't finish up. Like, um... And then there's some more areas coming. Will it be as uh, encompassing as it was for the mm -hmm. whole? Does this make sense of the whole, um, you know, ISAP? Or is it just it, since that's it, already in, do we redo the whole? I mean, yeah. No, nope, you're just going to do the new sections unless okay. there's an area that you needed to improve on, like right. a corrective plan. Um, but nope, you're just going to do those new sections. And as we're setting the rubrics up and having a year under our belt and working with the, the stakeholders and think tank, I can already tell you um, it's much it's much more black and white in terms of like, this is what you need to submit. It's, you know, the rubric is much okay. easier to follow. Um, it's, it's, I feel like it's very, having that year of knowing like, oh, this worked and that didn't work, yeah. you know, it's making it a lot cleaner and easier to follow on our side, which will only turn to be easier for you. Um, so I'm excited. I think this year will, it'll be a big sigh of relief in terms of what will be asked of you all. Great. Thank you. Of course. <clears throat> One other input I would have on that too, and Crystal uh, uh, talked about this with the integration with Infinite Campus. Currently, what, we'll, what we are doing is extracting data from Infinite Campus State Edition. And that's a, that's a currently it was a daily uh, feed over into Teach MT, and that's probably what we're still looking at. We are looking at how to maybe uh, do some of the validation reporting within Infinite Campus itself. So that, for example, uh, one of the reports validations is a misaligned teacher uh, report, where you're looking at those teachers that are accredited for this, but they're teaching this misaligned. Looking to see if we could put that within Infinite Campus as a validation. So that as you're working within Infinite Campus, you can update data, run a validation, make your corrections, and see that uh, that maybe that real time update. The way it works right now is if we make those corrections in IC and we extract that extract that data and load it into the the TeachMT system, this won't be till the next day that you can go out there and maybe run those validation uh, reports to see what that looks like. Now that being said, I mean that that's a that's a, something we're pursuing. We don't know if if an campus will allow us to do that, but we're we're looking into that. But that being said, though, um, once we turn on that live data feed from Infinite Campus into uh, TeachMT, you can be looking at updating that data not just during the accreditation process, right? If you have misaligned teachers, you could be looking at those at any point and be looking at to fix those before you get into the accreditation timeline and say, oh, now we're looking at this stuff now, holy moly. We've already had some districts asking, when are we gonna start updating that data so that they can start running reports? So we're also looking into that, where it is more um, of, a, of a methodology of you can update the data, not necessarily year round, but for a bigger period of time. 
because there is a time that we do freeze that upload of data so that Crystal's team can do the evaluations, do the scoring without that data changing. So kind of a snapshot thing, but just to pass that on as well. Okay, so next up we have Nicole Thua. I'm gonna talk about AIM, uh, the AIM calendar, data collections, and everything to do with that. So good afternoon, everybody. I am Nicole Thua, the AIM unit manager here at OPI. And I don't have a document to share, but I'm just gonna talk about some of the things our unit is working on. The first thing I'd like to mention is that all of our end of year collections in Infinite Campus were completed this year by July 11th. So that's your end of year attendance, enrollment and program participation, career and technical education reporting, uh, the personnel reporting that needed to be done for the compensation expenditure report that's later done in Mayfairs, and behavior and incident reporting. We're working right now on finalizing and posting the 2425 AIM data collection calendar. That should be posted on our AIM webpage within 24 hours. There's a couple of minor edits, and then that will be posted. So start looking for that tomorrow. Some of the new highlights on that calendar, we have a couple of new collections this year. The first one is in relation to early literacy. So there are a couple of components to that. The first one is the Jumpstart program, which is the summer early literacy program. This is for students who will be five by September 10th of this school year, entering through entering third grade. Um, this will generate an additional 0.25 FTE per student, as long as the district meets the four week, 120 hour requirement and the student has a qualifying eligibility record. The eligibility piece for early literacy is now in Infinite Campus for most districts. We know it's missing from the Montana edition, um, but that will be available shortly. Um, any of those programs, the hours that count are hours on or after July 1 for this school year only. So be aware of that component. We also have the classroom-based early literacy. This is for students who will be four by September 10th of this year. They must be enrolled in the pre-K grade, have a qualifying eligibility record, and have an indicator as participating in a classroom-based early literacy program. That indicator will be in the same area that you enter aggregate hours. It will also be available in the upload template it is not yet available, but it should be shortly. We're also tracking the home-based early literacy. So these are students that are participating in the Waterford program. They are tracked in Infinite Campus because they need an eligibility record, but they do not generate A and B or account for enrollment. These are students only in grades PK through two. Another new component this year will be the MAST assessment windows. So we are now transferring to a through year assessment, which means that we will have four test windows throughout the year, as opposed to the single test window. We will be uploading those scores into Infinite Campus so that districts may be able to see final scores and what assessments a student has completed when they enroll in the district. So when a records transfer is complete, a, an assessment record will be imported along with that as well. So more detailed assessment information. So if you wanted more information, for example, on which students or which standards the student was proficient on, that information will be available through the new Meridian platform. We are only gonna upload the final scores and the assessments taken in Infinite Campus. Um, a final note um, is the ACT assessment windows. So that's going to be three shorter test windows in the spring instead of a single test window. So just a couple of notes on that um, calendar when you get it this year. A couple of new data elements that we're gonna be collecting or coordinating in Infinite Campus this year. The first one will be the tracking of resident district and serving district. 
This will be located on the program participation tab. So you will create that program participation record. It will be separate from enrollment. So if you see now the resident district and serving district are part of enrollment, that will be moved to program participation. And that will allow you to track resident district um, for the purposes of importing that information into Mayfairs. We're trying to minimize duplicate data reporting as much as possible. The other advantage of putting that on program participation is if a student starts as an out of district student in kindergarten and remains for multiple years, even through graduation, you'll only have to enter one record instead of repeating the information on every enrollment. The other thing that we're going to track is the participation in the educational savings plan. So these are students who qualify for the educational savings account program. They will have an enrollment record in Infinite Campus that allows the student to be tracked for A and B at the resident district, but excluded from our regular student enrollment counts. Um, we're going to track the dates of participation. So if they start the year as an educational savings plan student, but then return to public education mid-year, we'll have that information as well as for students who start mid-year. So there will also be a secondary indicator in the non-public student database that our county superintendents use to enter homeschool and private school information so that those students are not included in federal program participation. All right, last bit of advice. When are you going to see our smiling faces? So we have a training plan that we're working on right now. Our first um, component of that training plan will be internal coordination with other OPI units. So we have assigned our individual staff members to program areas, and we will coordinate with those units for collections. So, for example, for A and B collections, we're going to have regular meetings and communication with school finance staff, both during and before and during collections. We have some new user guides. We actually have two of them that I believe were published today for the Jumpstart Summer Program and for calendars. Those will be posted on our OPI webpage. We have smaller checklists as well as a comprehensive user guide that has more detail. We're also coordinating with the Montana Small Schools Alliance. We've been invited to participate in the OPI boot camps. Those were, are coordinated by Serena Wright, who is Federal Programs, and Crystal Andrews, who you just heard from accreditation. So we'll be joining them September 13th in Great Falls, September 16th in Butte, September 18th in Kalispell, and via Zoom on September 20th. We will also be participating in the Infinite Campus user groups that will be held the week of September 23rd in Lewistown, Haver, Sydney, and Lockwood. Fall time is what we consider our East tour. And then we'll have additional regional workshops that are gonna be held in, a, in conjunction with accreditation in Missoula, Helena and Billings. We don't have those exact dates yet, but we're looking at the weeks of September 9th and September 30th. And the plan for those workshops is to have a morning and an afternoon time so that we have smaller groups. We'll do, for example, um, 8 to 1130 and then 1230 to 4. We'll talk for maybe 30, 45 minutes at most and then have work time and staff available to help with any of the components of fall data collection. So that's what we have on the agenda so far. So I'm open for any questions and I can put my contact information in the chat as well. I don't have any questions, but you all are working hard. <laughs> wow. We're trying, definitely. Hey, Nicole, this is Dustin Zufalato. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so question on, it sounded like you touched on program participation and it utilizing uh, a functionality to determine resident students and out of district. Um, I assume 
perhaps this may dovetail into the House Bill 203 tracking. Is that? That's correct. Um, is there any discussion? What's given us heartburn is um, from a parent perspective as well as the school district is, um, well, one of them anyway, uh, FP14 forms. Um, is there any plan to modernize or update those at any level? I would direct you to speak to either Barb um, or Paul Taylor. Barb Quinn or Paul Taylor in school finance, they are the ones that are coordinating the FP14 forms and the collection of that data. I think mm -hmm. they are planning to collect the information in Mayfairs, but I'm not sure what the plan is as far as the forms themselves. Okay. Yeah, it's been an undertaking with our, our county. I mean, I, we literally have hundreds of out-of-district students and um, I think just some way to centralize the data, um, considering that all the, you know, the tuition amounts will be derived from data in Mayfairs, um, as well as obviously the billing at the end of the year. And so I just thought and hoped that it's something that OPI could help with. Um, so, okay, I will direct my attention to them. Justin, I do believe the plan. Go ahead, go ahead Andy. I was going to say, Dustin, if you want to write that up, <clears throat> uh, what your your the concerns are and the issues are, and if you want to send that to me, then I can get Barb and Paul together and discuss that with them. And then if we want to, we can get back with you as a group to see how we might be able to modify that process. And I dropped my email address in the chat, andrew.campbell at mt.gov. Yeah. So um, as far as I know, Dustin, it's going to work a lot like the um, the state paid tuition does now and the state facility tuition where, you know, the districts who have the students are going to enter the information. And then there are reports that you can pull that give you the estimates for amounts and um, numbers of students and things like that. So I believe in the work I've done with them, coordinating the AIM information and the Mayfair's information. As far as I know, that's the plan, but I would definitely coordinate with Barb or Paul on the specifics on that. Okay, yeah, thanks for your insight. And Andy, I'll follow up with you with more specifics. I I think, you know, just timing wise, um, obviously you guys have a lot going on and this is one of the things you're trying to implement. Um, but from a logistical standpoint, it just makes way more sense, like you said, Nicole, to make it seem like the, the audit district that already occurs at the state level um, for those um, uh, in, you know, the resident districts that utilize the, um, the private placements and those sort of things. But now it's kind of obviously expanded multiple <laughs> Uh, exponentially, but uh, I think the same methodology would be very effective um, in knowing that it's going to be, you know, within our budgets next year with regards to our tuition fund levies and things like that. It just makes sense that you guys would want to ensure that we're doing that appropriately and in, in charging the right amounts and all that things anyway. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to put something in writing and, and try to help uh, make that happen. I think, you know, from the school's perspective, it feels behind, but I think it's just because we had to enroll all the students this year, but it doesn't really hit financially until uh, about a year from now. And so I think we've got time, but it just, uh, it's nice to know that hopefully OPI can help with that process. So i um, happy to help in that manner. Okay, any more questions for Nicole? Anna, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I might put you on the spot. Um, can you give a brief uh, up, uh, recap of the actual Education and Workforce Data Governance Board that happened yesterday? And maybe just a little bit around what, what that task force is for? Sure. So that task force, again, um, was was put into place after the last legislative session at, in House Bill 949. So the office, uh, so Office of Public Instruction, we are a member of that group, along with 
Department of Administration, OSHI, so the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education, and Department of Labor. There's also um, representation from the Board of Public Education, from the legislative branch, and a couple other places that I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but we've got this group that is really trying to look at how how we collect data, how data flows amongst specifically the Office of Public Instruction, so school data for K-12, along with OCHI, so higher education student data, and then how that also can flow into the workforce, so looking at Department of Labor. And right now, this group is has a couple different subgroups working on policy, research and implementation, I believe. And we are an active participant in all of those subgroups as well, um, looking at research questions across the state and how we utilize data to guide research, what research we can do using the data we already collect. We're also looking at um, the implementation. So one of the things, the data modernization update that I gave at the beginning of this meeting, um, is being looked at pretty closely with our school and how we are modernizing data systems at the Office of Public Instruction, how this can help to inform data collection and data modernization in other agencies, and in terms of the implementation aspect. And also, you know, there's the policy component too. This is why we have legislators that are also on these boards as non-voting members, but still get to have their voice heard. And then they can take that back into the next legislative session to help to guide the policy aspect of things as well. These meetings occur, I believe, quarterly. The subgroups on policy implementation and research meet more frequently. Um, I haven't been on any of those meetings, so I can't speak to the specifics of what they're talking about, but I know that a lot of good work is being done and a lot of collaboration is happening amongst all of these agencies at the state, which is really exciting to have that opportunity. Um, one of the big things is the data dictionary is being discussed and how we look at what data elements we're, we're collecting. There's a bunch of components into different conventions um, for sharing and naming data and how we collect and store that data. So all of these are then going to hopefully be standardized across the state. So it's not like you're getting information is go coming into OPI in one way and it's going into DLI a different way and into OCHI a third way. And this also, of course, impacts every agency at the state that because data is flowing everywhere, that's how we function anymore is through data. Um, so yesterday was their quarterly meeting to go over updates from those working groups. I'm gonna go see if I can find, I do have their agenda pulled up. So they talked about you know, some of the status reports. They did look at the research agenda draft and I believe they passed that draft. Um, I don't recall what's on it. And talked about data governance policies and data sharing requests. Um, and also had an update from PowerSchool on, um, on our project and also PowerSchool, how they can help other agencies throughout the state. And I don't know if that's a good enough overview or if there's any other additional information I can provide, but we are happy to answer questions on that as well from our perspective. Perfect. Thanks, Hannah. Um, one of the things that comes up in uh, both that governing board and then with OPI collecting data in general is how much data or the data that the OPI is collecting. So it's uh, the OPI collects data currently on data that we need to report uh, both federal and state reports. We don't go after collecting data that is not required for those purposes. Um, that poses maybe some uh, some issues when it comes to our data modernization project with our Unified Insights platform of not being able to populate, fully populate some dashboards because of the data that we are not pulling from a district level. Um, the same goes for on the, uh, the, the sharing and integration of data with uh, OCHI and DLI. 
sometimes they're looking for more data than what OPI currently collects. And there is a different uh, uh, philosophical beliefs, I guess, or beliefs of what data the OPI should be collecting and what data the OPI is uh, not collecting and what we are collecting. And that is something that needs to be worked out probably at the legislative level of what we're collecting. So not to get into any politics here of what we're collecting or not collecting, um, but I guess a, a general thing to think about is from a, at a, from a school district perspective, if it was uh, brought up or if it was asked to share more data than currently what's being asked to share, um, what would be the general feeling, do you think, from districts, from parents, from your stakeholders, if the state or another entity said we want all district data brought up to the state level? Any comment on what you believe your district, what your parents, what your stakeholders would think of that? Andy, help me understand a bit more what you mean by that. Is it like um, real time? Like we would be. I mean, so let's say, yeah, let's say it's grades, right? So Nicole, you can help me out a little bit here. Data that's at the district level that we do not collect at the state level. So that would be behavior, grades, course completion. Um, I'm thinking some things that might collect immunizations, counseling records, any of that kind of stuff. And, and the one that comes up a lot is grades. So I think Ochi uh, really wants to have grade data. Um, that Another big one is no. attendance. Another, yeah, Attend yeah daily attendance. attendance. Yep. So we don't collect that right now in the state edition of Infinite Campus, but those are things that are being kind of asked at the state, le at the uh, legislative level and at these work working groups of to say, if we had that more data, we can do X with that data. But there's also a belief of what data we collect and where, you know, we believe, OPI believes in local control so rather than us dictate of what is happening at the at the local district, is that's that's a local control thing. So if we look at the state saying, okay, now we want to collect all of those things that Nicole just pointed out. What do you believe uh, your stakeholders would think of that? So it sounds like a little bit between local control and public. Um, you know, ability to know or public disclosure. Um, and I think from a in one perspective is as we move towards data in, in the proficiency based, um, you talked about grades and I think, you know, the, the legislature for sure wants us to move to more proficiency based grading. Um, and I think that that information would be very helpful to them and I I struggle to understand why we wouldn't want to give that information. Um, I mean, I I like local control, but once it's in our, uh, I mean, from a parent's perspective, they might wonder, well, the, you know, the states now has data that they don't, shouldn't need to buy a kid and this and that. But like, uh, once it's within the districts, it's public information at that point anyway, right? Like, I don't, see the concern from that perspective, but maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, one of the things that uh, um, we're, we got to be, you know, we try to be careful of is any disclosure of PII or in some cases, uh, PHI, because you do contain you know, the immunization records, stuff like that. So any type of stuff where, you know, you have data that is in movement, that's now in other systems is where that data is at. and the possibility of privacy or security breaches on that data, right? So there's not a need. So there, there's that as well. So um, 
Yeah, I was just trying to get a feel for what a, what a district, and I know Eric has pointed out that uh, we've talked before about the Unified Insights platform and uh, in a different group and talk about how we could use that Unified unified Insights platform. If we had all of the district's data, how, bit, how much more useful it may be that a school can then uh, use that as, you know, not just as the state's data system, but use that as their own since all that data would be in that system to be able to dashboard and whatever, right, and, and report on. So, yeah, so thanks, Dustin, for the comments. Uh, we're just trying to get a feel for what that people may think about that. Uh, again, the legislates, uh, legislature uh, coming up in, in 25, they may modify uh, some language uh, on the 949 of what we do collect and then expand out this to be more specific on what they want. So thank you. Hey, Andy, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Uh, I would, another thing uh, kind of that comes to mind too with this is with our, uh, you know, transient population and probably even more so with open enrollment is if you guys had the data all the data, it'd be much easier for districts to transfer data between schools and have that more holistic look at the student um, as you know, students move from district to district, regardless of if they're a power school district or an infinite campus district. You know, for us, you know, in particular, and, and I, I'd assume probably like all the um, larger districts on power school you know we have 13 partner districts you know k-8s that feed into us and we get pretty limited student information blowing up because it's it's hard for us to really get and capture all that information on those students and so if it was all centrally you know accessible when we're you know migrating students between districts That'd be super helpful too. And and like we've talked about before, I think, you know, just overall the as from a district perspective, as long as there's, you know, not a huge lift when sharing this data, I think districts are in general gonna be on board. Um, you know, if it's you know the same lift as it was before or even better if it's even less of a lift because we, you know, you guys have created some efficiencies in that process. Yeah. Hey, Nicole, on the transfer of students in, and IC has that built in, right? I know that's not necessarily between um, other SISs, but doesn't IC have a transfer? If a kid's going from Helena to Billings, there's functionality there, correct? My mic was off. Sorry. Yes, that's correct. But we don't have necessarily, there's no functionality for non IC, like power school coming into IC kit or extracting an IC out into some kind of a formalized record or set of records that would make it so it's easily importable into another system. Importable, no. Um, but I mean, they do transfer between infinite campus applications. So if a student goes from an infinite campus district to a power school district, the information is there. It may be in PDF format, um, but it's there. It does transfer as live data for district edition to district edition. Right, yeah. But if it was in Unified Insights where they'd be able to like, you know, teachers be able to easily look at that data and vice versa, you know, for a power school districts and the IC districts, if it was all there at that global level to be able to look at those, at that, that record set. Yeah, and Eric, are, are you talking too more about once that student does transfer, about looking backwards at that student over, over time as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah.
Yeah. Andy, some of the data is limited as far as what gets transferred in Infinite Campus or like they don't get attendance records from a previous district or those sorts of things. They do, sure. They get grades, they get attendance. Um, some oh. of it, how it imports as live data, some of it is dependent on how well things match up. And I'm going to guess that's the same when records transfer between power school districts too. So if Kalispell has something in a custom field that Billings has in a standard field, it's not going to get transferred as neatly. And it's kind of the same thing with Infinite Campus. It kind of depends how data is set up and data is centered. I'm going to guess that's going to be the same problem we're going to have with Unified Insights. If, you know, um, Dustin is, if you guys are doing a standards based grading for K through three, that's based on a four point scale, but um, Kalispell is doing a standard based grading that's based on an A through D scale, it's going to be a little more difficult to match those things up. So some of it is, I guess, standardized data entry comparing apples to apples and so you know, there's a lot of questions I think still to be answered, but certainly it's something worth exploring. Yeah, and then again to Eric point two, if they do transfer, can I see that that historical data from a different district on that student? So that that Eric, I wrote that down. We'll ask Power School how that looks, if that's possible. That'd be that'd be good to see. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Uh, so we're close to the end of our hour. Uh, we had something on there called next step, next steps. And I think next steps may be uh, uh, any other topics we want to talk about. Uh, maybe one more thing, quick thing for you. Um, we are have another project uh, in our pipeline right now uh, for a uh, it's it's a it's a grant management system, kind of like our e-grant system. It's called Intelligrants. And one of the things that we're working on is um, for our Title I allocations, we didn't have a good system of tracking those title allocations into a system. Uh, we, it, was a, it was a spreadsheet system we get from the feds and kind of a cumbersome type thing. So we uh, contracted with a company called Agate Software. Uh, they have a product called Intelligrants that we're gonna put our title allocations in but also looking at that then for other type grant management and possibly looking at how that, you know, how those grants roll from e-grants into that. I mean, it's a two year uh, project at least we're looking at. So it's um, just getting underway, uh, nothing to worry about now as far as anything with grant management, everything is, is still within e-grants, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's on the horizon, so. Uh, the last thing, Anna, was I think the uh, next meeting. Yep, our next meeting is going to be October 23rd, and it'll be the same time, 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. And are there any topics that you may want to see on that next meeting or for us to address? Or if anything comes to mind um, after this meeting, you can shoot any one of us an email and uh, we'll, we'll get an answer for you. One of the things I did write down, and this is kind of back to Dustin, as far as um, having somebody from school of finance on this data monitor, uh, this uh, task force group. So we'll involve, uh, invite Paul Taylor. He is the, the new senior manager of school of finance. He's uh, replacing Barb Quinn, who's retiring here, I think this month or maybe in August. Um, so Paul Taylor is uh, sticking around. He's going to just get elevated and uh, maybe some more gray hair with his new role. So um, anything from the group? Representative Anderson, anything from you? Nope. I, I apologize for joining late. Uh, I had a little trouble getting on, but it's been very informative and, and I've certainly enjoyed the time. Perfect, thank you. Um, one parting uh, comment I'll leave, and then this is, you know, for everybody that works with OPI every day and uses our systems and our processes and inputs data, um, we wanna hear 
everything that is working, not working, your suggestions and ideas of how to improve, um, all of that stuff, that input you can provide us only makes us better to help uh, to help you guys do your job. Um, one of the things we talk about data modernization, um, the superintendent uh, today at our, at our Wednesday normal IT superintendent meeting, she really wants to talk about system simplification, not necessarily just data modernization. So that's kind of what we're looking at when we, we are moving things from tow into IC, we're trying to do more data integrations. So we're looking at how to make those things uh, simplify our, our processes. The systems are still complicated systems, but hopefully we make them so that's easier for you to use. So any input you have, uh, any, you know, if you, good or bad, just let us know, okay? All right, and with that, it's 4.30. I appreciate all your uh, time and some of you will see in other groups and then the rest of the group will see in November. So thank you very much. Thank you guys for all your work. Yep, thank you. Hey.